We live in a three-dimensional world, or at least we only perceive three dimensions. Imagine for a moment that there was an entire civilization that existed only in one dimension. Like a civilization on a stick, or I suppose it'd be more accurate to describe it as a civilization on a line. That civilization containing only life forms that can exist in that one dimension, completely different to us. They would have no idea there was anything outside of their line. Everything they can see acts and moves in that one dimension. In the same way, there could actually be more dimensions than we could perceive. That if we were teeny tiny, we could see more dimensions than we can at our current size. But for our purposes, we're going to deal with the dimensions we can see. And we can see that there are three spatial dimensions. Because string theory is incredibly complicated. And frankly, it's complicated enough just to understand the world in three dimensions. Because of this complexity, in physics we like to start in one dimension and work our way up from that. So if we just look at, say, a ball falling in that one dimension, if we can understand that motion, then when we look at more complicated situations in two dimensions and then ultimately in three dimensions, we can apply some of the same ideas to those. So we're going to look at motion in one dimension. But first of all, what is motion? Are you moving right now? How do you know? Well, you're probably twitching and moving your eyeballs around the screen a little bit. And maybe you're multitasking and texting at the same time. Although, if you are, stop that! You're supposed to be learning right now. But let's assume you could keep perfectly still, all the way down to your molecules. You could just keep everything completely still. Are you, as a whole, moving? Well, right now the Earth is spinning. And right here in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, I'm moving at 770 miles an hour because of the Earth spinning. Approximately that way. Maybe I should check this. Yes, it's that way. So I'm moving 770 miles per hour that way. But more than that, the Earth is moving around the Sun. At this time of day, that means I'm moving at approximately 66,000 miles per hour, slightly west of south, and a little downwards. But if we're going to get this right, we've got to go further. The solar system as a whole is moving at 43,000 miles per hour, approximately in the direction of the constellation Hercules. The solar system is just drifting towards other stars. But not only is it doing that drifting, but it's also zooming around the galaxy, orbiting the galactic center. And that's approximately 483,000 miles an hour, this time in the direction of the Cygnus constellation. And then one more step, the Milky Way, the whole galaxy, is also moving at 1.3 million miles per hour, this time in the direction of Leo and Virgo from our point of view. So if you're really moving at 1.3 million miles per hour, why can't you tell? I'll let you have a think about that. We'll come back to it later. This video is mostly about graphing. Before we start, I want you to put your right hand on your heart and raise your left hand. Do it right now. Everybody do it. Okay. Repeat after me. Graphs are important. Graphs are not boring. Graphs are important. Graphs are not boring. The reason I ask you to do that is that this is one of the topics that people tend to find dullest when they're studying physics. It can be quite tedious, but it's also vitally important. Graphs are how we visualize the world, how we contextualize things. And they're used in every area of physics, just based on the same principles. If I show you this data, what does it mean to you? Probably very little, but if I arrange it in this graph, suddenly everything becomes clear. As you may know from math class, graphs have equations that go with them. These are equations of straight lines. These are equations of curves. These are more complex equations. In physics, we use equations to describe the world around us. And one way we can discover these equations in the first place is by drawing graphs from our data. For example, in 1826, Georg Ohm did an experiment with a circuit where he measured the current and voltage around a circuit for different lengths and thicknesses of wire. He plotted his results and discovered that voltage correlates with current in a nice, neat straight line. From math class, an equation of a line is y equals mx plus c, where m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. In this case, v equals ir. There's no plus c kind of section to this graph, because in this case it goes through the origin. The y-intercept is zero. The c part is zero. But he found that if he plotted v against i, that it has a gradient r, which is the resistance of the material. And this equation is so important that basically every physics student has learned it for the last 100 years. So, back to graphs. First of all, we need something to graph. In 1D motion, there are three things that we tend to graph. Displacement, otherwise known as position. Velocity, 
and acceleration. And we like to look at how these things change over time, so we're going to plot them against time. How does your displacement from your origin change over a period of time? How does your velocity change? How does your acceleration change, or does it stay the same? These are the questions that we answer by plotting these graphs. If you don't know what acceleration is, don't worry, we'll talk about it shortly. So we draw graphs to describe those changes in displacement, velocity, and acceleration over a period of time. And later we can do some calculations with those graphs. This graph shows a car speeding up from a stoplight and then continuing at a nice constant velocity. It doesn't start at the origin, meaning that the origin must be 4 meters behind the stoplight. That origin is arbitrary, you could pick any position for your origin. So you could draw the graph like this, this would be fine too. If we were to draw a velocity dying graph of this motion, it would look like this. The car starts off not moving at all, and then it gradually speeds up until it reaches a constant speed, uh, like a cruising speed after the stoplight. Now converting this to an acceleration graph is a little bit harder. Acceleration tells you the rate at which your velocity is changing. So if you're moving at a constant 5 miles per hour on your bike, then your velocity isn't changing, so your acceleration is zero. But if you hit your brakes hard, you'll have a big acceleration all of a sudden. In physics, acceleration doesn't just mean speeding up, it also means slowing down. So when you slow down, when you brake on your bike, in physics they would say you're accelerating. You accelerate any time your velocity changes. It's the thing you feel when you're in the car. And acceleration is the answer to the question I posed earlier. Why don't you feel like you're moving at 1.3 million miles per hour? It's because it's a constant speed of 1.3 million miles per hour. Since you're not accelerating, moving at that speed feels exactly the same as not moving at all. We only feel it when we accelerate, when our velocity changes. This is part of what Einstein called relativity. From our frame of reference, we're not moving at all. But from the frame of reference of another galaxy, we're moving at 1.3 million miles per hour. Because we're not accelerating, those two points of view are considered to be equivalent to each other. It's all relative. So if we go back to our two graphs, the acceleration graph would look like this. There's an acceleration as the car speeds up from the stoplight, and then there's no acceleration once it reaches that constant cruising speed. If we're given one of these three graphs, we can use it to figure out the other two. There are two main ways to do that. One of them is kind of the way we already did, just using kind of conceptual thinking, understanding what's happening in the situation, and using our minds to kind of translate that into the other two graphs. But thanks to mathematics, there is a shortcut. The slope, or gradient if you happen to live in Europe, the slope of the displacement graph gives you the velocity. By calculating the slope, you get numbers that you can put on your velocity graph. Slope is rise over run, which in the case of a displacement time graph is displacement divided by time which you probably should already know is equal to velocity. Kind of like distance over time, but that would be speed. Instead, we have displacement over time. So here's an example of a displacement time graph where we're asked to draw a velocity time graph and an acceleration time graph. Notice that this is exactly the same graph that we used in the stoplight example, but now we're going to use the finding the slope method. Section one of the graph is a flat line. Since it's flat, its slope is zero. A flat line always has a slope of zero. If its slope is zero, that means its velocity is also zero. So for these first four seconds, we can draw a velocity of zero on the velocity time graph. Section two is a curve, and the curve starts off flat, starts off shallow, and gets steeper and steeper. At the very start, it's completely flat. It's still a slope of zero, and it's a velocity of zero. By then, it's really steep, so it does have a significant velocity. And that steepness increases at a gradual rate. So if the slope increases in steepness gradually, we can say that the velocity also increases gradually. So for section two, between four and eight seconds, we can draw a gradually increasing velocity. And then section three is a diagonal line. It's a constant slope. It doesn't get steeper, it doesn't get less steep. It's a constant slope. If it has a constant slope, a constant positive slope in this case, then it has a constant positive velocity. So we can draw a positive velocity on the velocity time graph from t equals eight seconds to t equals 12 seconds. So by thinking about the slope, we now have the shape of the graph. But the benefit of using this slope method is that we can now also put some numbers on the graph. If we're given some numbers in the displacement time graph, we can use those numbers in some slope calculations to figure out what numbers to put on our velocity graph. The first section, section one, it has a zero slope and therefore it has a zero velocity. So on the velocity graph, we have zero. There's no calculation to do that. Section two of the graph is a bit more complicated. Section two, the slope is continually changing. So we can't really do a rise over run for that. If we did a rise over run for that, we'd only figure out the average velocity during that time. That's not really helpful to us. So we're going to skip that section. But in the third section, there is a calculation we can do here. We realized it had a constant positive slope, and so we drew a constant positive velocity on the velocity graph. 
But we don't know what that constant positive velocity is. How fast was it going during that period? We don't know what the number is. So we can calculate the slope of this section to figure that out. So for a displacement time graph, the slope is equal to rise over run, which is equal to the displacement divided by the time that it takes for that displacement to happen, which in this case is equal to 48 minus 16. That's the difference in the y's. 48 minus 16 is 32. And we have to divide that by the difference in the x's, which in this case is t, so the difference in the t's if you like. And that's 12 minus 8, which is 4. Do 32 divided by 4, and we get 8 meters per second for the velocity in section 3. So we can mark that 8 on our velocity time graph. Now this question we're trying to answer also asked us to draw an acceleration time graph. I said earlier that by taking the slope of the displacement time graph, we get a velocity. But then if we take the slope of the velocity time graph, we get the acceleration. So now that we have a velocity time graph, we can use the same steps again to go from the velocity time graph to drawing an acceleration time graph. Section 1 of the velocity time graph has a zero slope, it's flat. Since it has a zero slope, since it's flat, it must have a zero acceleration because the slope of this graph is the acceleration. So we can draw on our acceleration graph an acceleration of zero during section one. An acceleration of zero from t equals zero seconds to t equals four seconds. Section two of the velocity time graph has a constant slope. It's a constant positive slope, so we can draw a constant positive acceleration on our acceleration time graph. In section three, we have a zero slope. It's flat again. And again, a zero slope means zero acceleration. So now it goes back down to zero acceleration. So we can draw zero acceleration on our acceleration time graph, this time between eight seconds and 12 seconds. So now we have the shape of our acceleration time graph by just thinking about the slope. Now we need to put some numbers on it again. Section one, the slope is zero. We already have the number, it's flat. There's no calculation we can do there. Section three is also flat. It's also a zero acceleration. There's no slope calculation we can do there. But in the middle, section two, we have a constant slope, which means a constant acceleration. And so we can calculate the number that that acceleration is by actually calculating the slope. The slope of this velocity graph, which is the acceleration, is equal to rise over run, which in this case is equal to the change in velocity divided by time, which is equal to 8 meters per second, divided by the period of time over which that change in velocity happens. It happens between 4 and 8 seconds. 8 minus 4 is 4, so it happens over 4 seconds. 8 over 4 gives us 2 meters per second per second. So we can mark this acceleration of two meters per second per second on our acceleration time graph. And now every important number on the graph is marked. Now there's one more thing you need to know. How do you go backwards? In this question, we're given the displacement time graph and told to find the velocity and acceleration. But what if you were told the acceleration time graph? How do you go back and find the velocity graph and go back and find the displacement graph? To do that, you don't find the slope. To do that, you find the area under the line or the area under the curve. To keep this short, let's skip the acceleration part and just go straight to the velocity time graph. Here's that same velocity time graph again. Now let's go to the process of going backwards if we didn't know what the displacement time looked like. I know it's getting a bit tedious using the same graph over and over again, but hopefully it will convince you better that this actually works. So section one of this graph is flat right on the axis. The area between the line and the axis is zero. There's no space between the line and the axis. It's right along it. So there's no area to calculate here. So that means between zero and four seconds, the displacement must have been zero. It must have been staying where it was. Now the only problem with this is we don't know where it started. We don't know if it started at a displacement of zero, if it started at the origin, if it started past the origin. So we might not be able to get the graph exact, but let's just assume that it starts at the origin, in which case the displacement graph will look like this. It's staying where it is at the origin. Section two, we really can calculate an area this time. Section two, the area between the line and the horizontal axis is a triangle. To find the area under a triangle, we do base times height divided by two, which in this case is four times eight divided by two. And if you calculate that, that comes out as 16. Although it's an area, it's not 16 meters squared, like you might think, because what we're actually calculating is the displacement. It's just 16 meters. So between four and eight seconds in this section two, the displacement is 16 meters. The position changes by 16 meters. Now, the only problem with this is we don't really know whether it's gonna be a diagonal line, a curve, what it is. We have to think a little bit more to figure that part out. The calculation alone doesn't tell us that part. But if we look at it, the velocity starts off at zero, not moving at all. And at eight seconds, the velocity is eight meters per second. So so it's speeding up. The first second it's going more slowly, it's not going to cover much ground. The last second it's going a lot faster, it's going to cover a lot more ground. So a diagonal line wouldn't make sense here, it has to be a curve, getting steeper and steeper. Section three, again, we can calculate the area under the line. This time it's a rectangle. Looking at our axes, we have eight along the vertical axis and we have four seconds along the horizontal axis. 12 minus eight is four. Multiply both those sides together, four on the horizontal axis multiplied by eight on the vertical axis. Four times eight or eight times four 
gives us 32 meters. So in this last four seconds, the displacement is 32 meters. Before section three started, it was already looking at our position graph at a position of 16 meters. So if it starts at 16 meters and goes another 32, 32 plus 16 gives you 48. So it finishes up this third section at a displacement of 48 meters. An additional 32 on top of the 16 is already traveled. And since it's going at a constant velocity in this section three, its displacement is going to change at a constant rate, which is a diagonal line. So in summary, if we're given a displacement time graph, we can find the slope of each section of that graph, use that to plot the velocity graph, and then we can find the slope of the velocity time graph and use that to plot the acceleration time graph. Going the other way is a little harder. We can still use the slope concept and a little bit of thinking to get the shape of the previous graph, but we'll have to find the area under the graph to figure out the numbers to go on the previous graph. So thanks for watching, I hope that wasn't too dull and boring, but it is very important information that's gonna help you as you move on to more interesting topics. Don't forget to leave a comment with your questions, thoughts, and suggestions. Until next time, keep questioning, and Spark is always reliable. Screw you, lizard. <laughs>